morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, and thank you for joining this learning series webinar, The Opioid Epidemic, a Focus on Vulnerable Populations. And for those of you who have continued to follow this webinar series since uh, 2021, you'll know this is the third time that we're addressing this very important topic. And so thank you for joining us and uh, so excited to, to have this conversation today. Um, today's webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit, one ANCC contact hour, one ACPE contact hour, one AAPA category one CME credit, and one ADA CERP continuing education credit. And for any pharmacists who are claiming credit, please note that your credit will be uploaded to the CPE monitor within 30 days. This webinar has also been approved by New Jersey OEMS for one EMT elective CEU. I have a disclosure to make. Uh, PA planner Dean Barone discloses that he serves on the Speakers Bureau of Ethicon. Today's webinar is jointly provided by the Partnership for a Drug for New Jersey and the American Academy of CME Inc. and is being held in collaboration with NJ Cares and the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General and the Opiate Education Foundation. And I thank them for their partnership, support, and collaboration on today's learning activity and throughout this year long learning series. And today is the last learning series uh, webinar of 2023. So appreciate everyone's uh, support uh, throughout this past year. Um, I appreciate our expert speakers who I'm so pleased to introduce who are joining us today. We have Dr. Michael Gannon, who's joining, who's with us. We have Matthew Rudd, the Community Justice Coordinator, uh, Special Agent, Strategic Planning and Programs for the Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office. We have Tevis Thompson, who's the Project Manager for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Initiatives for the Office of Treatment and Recovery Supports at DMHAS. And we have Henry Reyes, from DHSC, who is the, um, the Assistant Division Director, Office of Treatment and Recovery Supports at DMHAS as well. So I welcome all of our expert speakers. I thank you for being with us today uh, for this important conversation. And uh, Dr. Gannon, I will now turn the presentation over to you to kick us off. Thank you very much, Angela. Uh, I am Dr. Mike Gannon. I'm an addiction medicine specialist in Sussex County in Northwestern New Jersey. And I'd like to first thank all of the entities uh, that Angela mentioned responsible for bringing this important information to you all. And I'd like to thank you all for your efforts to make the lives of people who use drugs better in, in whatever way you're involved. This talk is entitled Rural Opiate Use Disorders, Problems and Promise. Next slide, please, Matt. What is rural? Rural defined by the US Census is no county in New Jersey. But clearly if you've been around New Jersey, there are counties that look awfully rural. And a more common definition is uh, less than 500 people per square mile. By this more useful definition, uh, about one third of New Jersey's counties are rural uh, versus about one fifth nationally. So we actually have more rural counties uh, than the average state does. Go ahead, Matt. <clears throat> and you can zoom through these next four pictures, Matt. And the next, thank you. Yeah, those first two pictures were uh, pictures of Newark, New Jersey. Uh, albeit a few years ago. And the second two pictures were pictures of rural areas um, in uh, Sussex County, uh, both within my view, within blocks of where I have lived. So I think to most people's eye, the rural counties would look like they're safer. But the question is, are they really? And the next slide looks at NJ CARES data from 2018 to 2020. Uh, and in the last column, uh, in more recent data from 2022. It's a little bit of a busy slide, um, but I would direct your attention to the first line and the third line, Atlantic County and Camden County. Atlantic County is almost 80% rural, Camden County only about 31% rural. And the second and third columns are looking at the number of deaths per number of residents. So that smaller numbers are actually worse. If you look at Atlantic County in that second column from the 2018 to 2020 timeframe, you will see that about one in 1500 people died of an opiate overdose in that time frame. In Camden, one in 2500 people. So 
your chances of dying in Camden County were significantly greater as an individual than if you lived in Atlanta County. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in Camden County, your chances were much less of dying. Uh, if you look at the last column, um, Atlantic County had one death per roughly 1,000 people. Camden County, one death per 1,400 people. So about 40% difference in your death rate if you were in rural Atlantic County versus urban Camden County. Next slide, please. This is even more stark if you look at counties that are both suburban and urban. If you look at Union County and Hudson County, for example, Union County encompassing Linden, Elizabeth, and Rahway, fairly big cities in their own right, and Hudson County, Bayonne, and Jersey City, those counties have 0% rural area. And your chances of dying in Union County were about one in 5,000 uh, in the year 2022. But in Cumberland County, which has the giant cities of Bridgeville, Bridgeton, rather, Millville, and Vineland, your chances of dying of an opiate overdose were one in 1934. Boiled down to a very easy number to understand, an individual is two and a half times more likely to die of a drug overdose in very rural Cumberland County than in very urban, suburban Union County. Next slide, please. Big question, why is this? I've boiled down the why to six basic reasons. Um, and you can read them on this slide. I don't need to read them for you. And we'll be talking about each of these reasons um, a little bit more in detail as we move along. Next, Matt. Stigma was the first. Um, there is stigma in the community at large and there is stigma for individuals. The stigma in the community at large is not negated. I was, I was, I was dr driving to my office today, and as I was driving into, into Newton, um, I saw a sign that said stigma-free town. I've seen that sign for years. Um, and I would say that while we have made some inroads into reducing stigma in Sussex County, uh, we're far from where we need to be. If you look at this map of the 2016 presidential election, you see that wide swaths of the country, mostly rural, um, are bathed in red. And we see the cities, the Northeast, and the West Coast being predominantly blue. Stigma in the rural areas vote, are people that vote mostly in a conservative way, mostly in a Republican way. And we clearly have a big political divide in this country currently. And we also have a social divide in this country. And I don't think that that comes as a surprise to any of you. Next slide, please. When we look at people who use drugs and we look at the problem of substance use in general, folks that have conservative leanings generally have one view of the problem. People that have liberal or progressive views of the problem have a different view of the problem. Conservatives typ typically um, sorry, um, think of the problem and people who use drugs as having a moral failing, a character flaw, a willpower issue. They view it as a criminal problem and generally have been very supportive of the war on drugs. They don't support medication in general. And, and I know that I'm making broad generalizations, but clearly the people in Sussex County who were driving around with Confederate flags on the back of their pickup trucks have different views than the people who had Priuses and were supporting Hillary and had bumper stickers for that or were supporting uh, the Democratic candidate. So um, <clears throat> the conservative view is we don't like medication. Um, because people who have a character flaw or a moral failing don't need or deserve medication. And as employers, a conservative person is certainly not likely to hire somebody with a moral failing and a character flaw. If that's your view, that's your view, and it's hard to change. So putting up a sign or saying we need to do more is it, still hard to change people's views. The more liberal view is we view the problem as a public health problem, as a disease. Um, we look toward harm reduction and we look toward offering more treatment and outreach for treatment. We certainly favor medication, the gold standard 
of treatment for opiate use disorder. And rather than thinking, we won't hire you, we would say, we will train you or we will retrain you. Next slide, please, Matt. That's the general population-based problem of stigma. But there is a problem in rural areas of stigma for the individual. There's a problem because we can't hide. Everybody in Sussex County knows everybody else. Everybody in Sussex County knows everybody else's business. And Sussex County is pretty big and pretty densely populated as far as rural counties go. Um, but if you get into a much smaller town, um, a town of 500 people, then certainly everybody knows everybody. And if everybody in town views you as having a moral problem or a character flaw, then you are unlikely to come out of the woodwork and seek care. Gossip is a currency in rural areas. Um, people sit on their porch, people talk at the barbershop, people talk at the pharmacy, and everybody knows everybody. And this isn't limited to the general population. The physicians, the pharmacists, the probation officers, the doctors in the emergency department, corrections people, and even people in social service agencies have often been raised in rural areas. They've been raised with conservative values. Those conservative values are still pervasive in their community and they hold tightly to them. Next slide, please, Matt. <clears throat> rural areas have fewer care providers for people who use drugs than urban areas or suburban areas. So there's a lot of reasons for that, but the numbers are stark. 80% of rural areas have no psychiatrist, 90% no psychiatric APN. Um, behavioral health uh, folks are a, at a great minimum. Um, and about a year or two ago, um, before all physicians were allowed to prescribe buprenorphine, 56% of rural counties had no available provider for buprenorphine, the gold evidence based standard for opiate use disorder care, and 17% just had one provider. Next. Why is it so hard to get doctors in rural areas? Well, one is an economic reason, that's bullet point four, but um, because there are fewer people and fewer insured people, so it's less likely for a doctor to set up practice there. But there are a lot of regulatory issues that surround the problem of, of treating folks with substance use disorders. And for an individual physician or two to try to figure out and comply with all of those regulatory issues can be very difficult. So physicians tend to gather in large practices where they have a lot of help with those regulatory issues. Also, the medical problems of people who use drugs can be a lot more complex than that of people who don't use drugs. Um, and those of us in private practice in addiction medicine need folks to help us, infectious disease doctors, cardiologists, and other specialists, psychiatrists, certainly, um, to help us. And if they're unavailable, it makes it difficult to take great care of our patients um, who most need it. And uh, you're probably all familiar with the acronym NIMBY, not in my backyard. If you are working in a very conservative area, um, the people in the area do not want treatment facilities in their backyard. Next, please. <clears throat> there is a tremendous disparity in education and thus employment and financial resources in rural areas compared to more urban areas. Um, you can see the discrepancies between the number of people who have bachelor's degrees in one area versus another, the amount of money they make. People who have great jobs and lots of money can get great care. People who have no commercial medical insurance and no money have a difficult time getting great care. And so that is a big problem uh, for people who live in rural areas is that disparity in education, employment, and money. Next, please, Matt. Transportation is a problem. If you don't have any money, you probably don't have a car. In rural areas, there's no good public transportation, and it's difficult to get to medical treatment. Next, please. Communication is a problem. You know, telemedicine was great during the pandemic if someone could access telemedicine. 
but a lot of the people that I was taking care of during the pandemic did not have good access to high-speed broadband. They had pay-by-the-minute phones and their cell service was poor and it made that very difficult. Next, please. What's the fix? Well, it's obviously a big problem and if it could be fixed, it might be fixed by now. But I think that bringing care to the people with mobile vans, harm reduction centers, and more access to telemedicine would be a big help. Next, please and removing the structural barriers uh, to the best evidence care uh, based care would be important and helpful as well. And some of those suggestions are listed here. Next, please, Matt. And last, I would like to say that this is really a matter of priorities. We've spent a trillion dollars in the war on drugs since 1971, $50 billion a year. And we've seen increases in death, increases in death, increases in death, yet, we continue spending money on the war on drugs. And just this last year, $3 million was earmarked for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's a matter of where we send the money and where we spend the money. I thank you all very much for your time. Thanks, Dr. Gannon. I appreciate um, you joining us this morning. I know uh, you're having some technical issues um, with your camera, and but we could hear you clearly. And uh, next we have um, our next speaker, um, Matthew Red, who's coming to us from the Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office, another rural area in our state, just uh, obviously the opposite of where Dr. Gannon's coming from um, in terms of uh, geographic region. So uh, Matthew, good morning and welcome. Thank you for that warm welcome. And thank you, Dr. Gannon, for really setting up uh, my presentation in a, in a really effective way. Um, the, the, the transition from what you laid out, Dr. Gannon, into what I would like to talk to is really about those elements of fix and where do we see some of the correlation around the priorities that we're setting. And so if, if you're looking at this slide, um, one of the dynamics that is unique about Sussex versus Cumberland really would be the North versus the South. And if you're looking at this heat map to, to the right of the slide, one of the dynamics here is really looking at the South having a much more concentrated issue with opioids being prescribed, right? And so this would be doctors and uh, uh, pharmacies and dentists and, and nurse practitioners who are prescribing controlled dangerous substances for us here in the South. And we start to ask, well, if the rural dynamics, right, Cumberland would rank 16th by population, Sussex 17th, what does that mean for us, right? And so we're one of the things that I would like to pose really is that economic reality where the those that have the drug harm index really are the ones that are more rural but also more impoverished. And so one of those dynamics um, is, is something that we start saying, well, what do we do about that? Next slide, please. Um, I don't need to lay out more, uh, but here is a little bit more for your sake, uh, that Cumberland really does have a lot of difficulties with our rural population, but also just in drug harm index when adjusted for, for population. So the per capita numbers that you're looking here are from the Drug Monitor Initiative, and it's saying, well, here's where we are by population, but here's what we look at uh, adjusted for the population to put apples to apples comparison, more scripts. Uh, really high ranked on the naloxone administration, number four for drug deaths, wow. number one for a drug related uh, arrest possession, and number one for theft arrest. So those, uh, oh, and that really shoots our ranking up to number four. And so that's one of the things that we start saying, well, what can we do about this issue? Um, we have a number of cities that are where a lot of the, the crime and the drug harm tends to concentrate. But then we have that rural dynamic that I would say becomes an economic issue overall. Next slide. So when we start addressing this and we start looking at what are the fixes, what are the things that we can do here to start addressing, we have to take into account um, the, the strategy behind it. And so here's what we're looking at when we're saying assessing the barriers and challenges, would first we would say transportation is probably one of the biggest one. And transportation isn't just solely how does uh, infrastructure exist or how do people get from one point to another? Um, it really comes down to then access, right? Which is a further uh, tile here within the same slide. 
But that at that aspect of transportation shows up again and again and again, and not just solely because of public transportation and building that out, but also because of the stigma that's behind it. So for someone who lives in a highly uh, populated area where using a train or using a bus system is kind of the norm across the, the segment of population, that would be a, a normal thing for people to use, there's less stigma. But if you predominantly have vehicles, uh, cars that people are using, in our rural county, this actually becomes uh, a, a depressant for people to use those public transportation systems, which is just simply a, a, a dynamic that we then have to say, well, how are we getting people into treatment access? How are we giving them equitable care? The next piece that I would say is credibility has one has been one of those barriers and challenges because we have to be able to uh, contend with doing what we say we're going to do, right? So if we're uh, trying to address the barrier around access, having a 24-7 live answering hotline needs to have someone answering the phone. If we're going to provide this as a stopgap uh, to try to address the rural challenges that we have, we have to, to follow up and, and make sure that we're doing it. otherwise um, we'll be limited in our ability to help. That treatment access is something that Dr. Gannon just spoke to around less providers in the area means then we're saying, okay, how do we get them into the thing that they need? How do we address that by uh, going much more to them? And that's one of the dynamics I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and, and lastly, I would say this is segues into the, uh, you know, if we don't have partner buy-in, we're not collaborating, we're not going to be able to address these issues because we have such limited and the scarcity dynamics are really much more prevalent for us. And those deficits make it uh, something that we have to overcome by getting partner buy-in and collaborating. Next slide. So to drill this down, I wanted to show you this slide. It's a lot on it, and I know these slides are coming to you later, but here's the, the real key here is demonstrating the uh, collaboration that we have found effective, right? So if we have all these challenges and rural dynamics only exacerbate that, working collaboratively is gonna be really helpful. And so this Capital Recovery Center has been really a hub for us in addressing some of those challenges where we have a brick and mortar location, but then many points of access or outflow from that center. So you can see, uh, you know, at the top left, the Operation Helping Hand, which I'll discuss in a second with our timeline, has been really critical for us in terms of dollars that have supported our efforts around a mobile unit as well as promoting to law enforcement and to the community that they can send people to the Recovery and Wheels mobile unit, as well as to the hotline. And that's going to then drive them towards the recovery support that has the continuity of care to saying, how can we help you with your recovery today? What do you need? Let us help you overcome the barriers to you being healthy and empowered. And so the, those points of access mean going much more to the people rather than waiting for them to come to us. Next slide. This one is again, very busy, lots on it, and you don't need to absorb all of this information. Really, this is simply to point out when addressing some of these things, we look tend to, to think, well, what can we do in a one year or three year term? I would pose that when you're trying to solve some of these problems, it's much more effective to think along in a decade. And so you can see on the left from 2015, all the way to, to things that we're still doing uh, today. And, and we're really, proud of the work that we've been able to accomplish with saying more and more momentum is needed as we've found things that are working and try to uh, uh, build on that success and make more momentum successful. So I mentioned the Operation Helping Hand um, that shows up in about 2018, 2019, uh, about a two thirds or a third of the way through the slide left to right. And that has been something that we've continued to do and build on it, build on it, build on it for the sake of helping more people. Because what we've found is there's no single thing that is really effective, but instead trying to build many pathways and develop solutions to the barriers that people are finding. And so that's going to be a, a, a thing where we're addressing uh, EMS doing BUP, uh, finding ways to actually transport people to treatment appointments, having the recovery center at the courthouse able to, to help people who are uh, willing to now move into to recovery resources. Next slide. 
So here's essential considerations for us whenever we're thinking about diversionary programming or ways that we're trying to get closer to the vulnerable populations that we think need to be served. So whether that's youth, people struggling with substances, uh, people who have mental health concerns, those who have chronic diseases, our immigrant population, and especially the overarching correlation is those who are impoverished, which often that means they have limited access um, and capacity to really get out of survival mode and get into that healthy and empowered that we're, we're after. So those central considerations as we're considering those populations um, really does first start with money. I showed you that that slide with the, the map of New Jersey and some of the disparate um, realities as Sussex is double the per capita income that Cumberland is, despite being similar in population and density. So that that idea of procuring funding to make sustainable our uh, realities a, a thing um, has to come through uh, finding where we can get that money and move it economically into our county to serve our people, which then goes into the that requires leadership and staffing and partnerships that are essential for us to make those recovery initiatives possible. And that leadership dynamic is something that I've consistently kind of pounded the table in a rallying cry saying, if we don't have this leadership deficit addressed, we can't get more money and we can't sustain these efforts. So who, who will step up and who will do this? And calling not just uh, our own unit, but our own uh, leadership really to say, let's expand these efforts. Um, when this goes to the next point around risk, and, and I've been um, surprised at really one of the dynamics that we've had to consistently address is the concern around liability and whose responsibility is that and, and how are we going to handle the risk that's present, whether that's uh, a legal liability or it's the, the stretch that gets into time and effort or that it puts on someone's staff if they agree to do something. Um, but we found that as we're starting to say collaboration is the key to addressing risk, we've been able to overcome those through written documentation and setting good expectations. And that time dynamic of, of setting enough time to allocate leadership to address those challenges has been a really big factor of saying, well, if we have money and we have the leadership support, then creating the time and carving that out as something that's really essential that is something that gives more credence to allow us to say it's worth addressing these vulnerable populations because they are really struggling. And then lastly is, is effort, which kind of goes back to that timeline slide that I, I said is that this needs to be iterative. We need to give space and grace for us to keep failing forward and figuring out what works as we're addressing the unique challenges that our population is, is experiencing. Next slide. So here's what we really, whenever we're thinking of, you know, whether it's youth or mental health or immigrant population, here's the factors that we're considering, right? And once we say we have these uh, in place, we're ready to now launch into something new. So first has to be, do we have clarity on what we're doing? Do we have the shared goals? And we know how that's going to work. We know we're starting with the end of mind and what we want to do. Second, we have to have that concerted leadership. If we don't have the momentum and the leadership behind the effort, it's not going to sustain. It's not gonna go uh, any further than whatever that immediate circle of influence. Third, we really like to add to existing efforts. And this not only um, takes into account what has been done and some of the best practices going forward, but also it gets a lot of the infrastructure already in place. And so this allows us to then say, we can build on and maximize what we have. Fourth, we need to have readiness. If we don't have readiness, right, we want to move towards a harm reduction model and serving our people. We're going to put up a new place, but the community politically is not ready or there's uh, some missing pieces, then we can't move forward. But if we do have it, let's go. This is this is great for us. The community is calling out for it. We have all the, the pieces in place. Um, dedicated staff and resources are going to be essential for us to have the capacity to sustain our effort. And so that's gonna be something that money provides the opportunity to have that dedicated staff and the know-how and expertise to start moving into this new effort of addressing someone. And then lastly, I'd like to end on this part around utilizing data because it really is essential for us if we're going to demonstrate what did work or what didn't work and then be able to make appropriate inferences inferences about how we're gonna proceed as we do this again and again and again 
based on that iterative process. So that data component in that timeline slide has been really effective for us to say, oh, this is why we need to now start working on giving MAT through our EMS partners. This is why we need to start a diversion program. This is why we need to have co-occurring as part of our model, not just SUD or mental health, but bring them together and try to get justice involved persons into recovery resources that go to the root of the problem. Last slide. Uh, that is the extent of my presentation. And so really this is a, a brief overview to simply say, um, we are glad to, uh, to work with our vulnerable populations because morally they need this. Um, <clears throat> and, and secondly, I would just say, um, this is the kind of thing that I would call out for help. We need uh, these kinds of points to, to reach all of our constituencies and help us with the resourcing to continue this effort. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matthew. Appreciate um, you sharing that um, with all of our attendees today and having collaborated with you many times in the past and with the uh, Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office. It's um, great that you're able to share some of those uh, experiences with our audience today. So now we have our, um, our next uh, team of uh, experts who are gonna be uh, speaking to us. We have uh, Harry Reyes, um, who is from DMHAS and Tevis Thompson also from DMHAS. So um, I welcome you both and uh, we'll turn the presentation over to you. Great, uh, thank you, Angela. First, we wanna thank the um, Attorney General's Office, NJ Cares, Opioid Education Foundation of America and the Partnership for Drug Free New Jersey, you and Matt for allowing us to join your presentation today. I also wanna thank our two previous presenters because what we're about to talk about ties into the services of which they're speaking and the impact that it does have on the individuals who in the world of deaf and hard of hearing. And so I am here with my colleague, Tevis Thompson, um, I will be um, sharing, we'll, we'll do a tag team process as it relates to our PowerPoint, um, and we will hopefully bring you information um, as it relates to um, the services that are um, here at the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Tevis, any entry words? Uh, just thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited about this, and um, I hope to provide you with some good baseline information and uh, some resources that are out there for our deaf and hard of hearing population. So thank you all. And thank you for uh, Dr. Gannon and Matt for your presentations as well. Great, thanks Angela. Can we um, go to our next slide? <clears throat> so we're gonna start this by indicating that the substance use and the deaf and hard of hearing population, right? So the prevalence of use based on the National Institute of Health and the National Health Survey indicate that 15% of deaf people in the United States have a co-occurring diagnosis. That number is estimated to be about 40 million. That is 43% higher than the general population <clears throat> and individuals at 13% who are 18 and older report a hearing impairment or difficulty. I do wanna say that the majority, all of the articles the scholarly articles that I read all started with the fact that there is not enough information and research done on this population, that this is empirical data, that the need to be more thorough and more scientific clearly is evident, and that this population, um, sadly, is not the recipient of most of the new information that comes out because of the lack of how that information is generated into the community. And we'll sort of talk a little bit about that as we go through the PowerPoint. So one of the most common substances for um, abuse is alcohol, marijuana, and prescription opioids. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that most of available treatment options, the marketing is poor as it relates to addressing and targeting the deaf and hard of hearing community, that this information is not so readily available, right? So communication obstacles, the, and Dr. Gannon spoke about this in a previous slide, we are facing a workforce shortage and there is no more um, struggles than the um, finding qualified interpreters. 
and I watch Tevis as she struggles to find individuals to assist um, the deaf and hard of hearing population as they are reaching out for substance abuse or mental health services and our um, attempt to help through the assessment or actual treatment process. I also want to say here that not just English is not their first language, the, the communication is not easily transferable, right? So the issue of signing and English is not effectively transferred in the same way. I also want to say that it's not listed here that I, I really do want to say an individual who is deaf and or hard of hearing, they are not the same person. There is a difference in a deaf individual and a difference in a hard of hearing individual. And that we tend to cluster them together, but they really are separate um, individuals with separate issues. And in the Department of Human Services, there is a division of deaf and hard of hearing. It's under the leadership of Elizabeth Hill as their executive director. And we work very closely with that division as it relates to providing interpreter services in the world of mental health and addiction services, inclusive of alcohol abuse. Um, there's misinformation and assumptions about lip reading abilities, which most of the documents I read, an individual, a hearing person is under the assumption that if I speak to a deaf person, they automatically know how to lip read. The other concept is that they'll write. If you can't hear, then I'll be able to write or you'll be able to write and we'd be able to communicate effectively. And that also is a failed attempt to address issues for the individual. I'm just trying to bring out points that we think may be correct and they are truly incorrect. Next slide. Okay, so thank you, Harry. Um, so we're gonna talk about deaf culture. Um, the, the deaf community in and of itself is, is made up of different groups of folks. A person who can, a large number of our deaf individuals identify as cultural and linguistic minorities, not as persons with disabilities. And we need to make sure that we're being culturally sensitive to that. We don't, they don't want to be fixed. They're fine, they can do everything anybody else can do, they just can't hear. So that's an important point. Um, our small d deaf community are persons that may use technology like cochlear implants, hearing aids, identify as deaf disabled, um, and are um, also a part of the deaf community. We also have our hard of hearing population, various stages of hearing loss, and many facets of that community work as well. Those individuals don't know American Sign Language. These are your people that may have become deaf before they learned how to speak, became left, became deaf after they learned how to speak. So we have prelingually deaf, postlingually deaf. We have people that are over 18 and, and adults that have become deaf due to something maybe that occurred, an accident of some sort, too much loud music, an illness. They're considered late deaf and adults. We also have our individuals who are elderly, senior citizens, age-related deafness, okay? These are all folks that need different approaches to their care and their communication access. So being sensitive to that and not bringing everybody under one umbrella of deaf is very, very, very important. Isolation is universal among deaf and hard of hearing communities, no matter how they identify. Um, you know that persons who are hard of hearing very much struggle in group situations Ambient noise is an issue, um, people not facing them, people turning away, knowing how to talk with them, um, that's a problem. Um, our deaf individuals who have different levels of hearing loss, almost complete hearing loss, are very isolated. Um, something that was very shocking to me, I grew up in a deaf family, everyone in my family signed. When I started training as an interpreter and was teaching deaf individuals English, how to read and write English, learning that many of their family members didn't sign. They were completely, completely isolated within their home families, let alone the extended family of cousins, grandparents, aunts, and uncles. Same thing with deaf individuals that go to mainstream schools. 
maybe they have an interpreter in their classroom, but they aren't able to make those social connections with their peer group who are hearing. So they tend to be a very isolated community. Our elderly, our latent deafened individuals also tend to isolate because it's too hard to try to communicate with people to hear what people are saying. So they tend not to go out, not to join um, activities, not to go to parties. They tend to isolate and stay at home. Their ability to access phone communication is also very difficult, another way that they become isolated. Um, socializing outside the deaf community is almost non-existent. Um, when we bring people into treatment and recovery, we want people to find a new support system, a new group of friends, a new way of going through life. We're asking them to leave those old behaviors and those old friends that they used to use with behind and find a sober group of individuals to become a support system and to help them stay away from their substance of choice. The deaf do not have that so readily available. Um, it's not a matter of them just saying, okay, you know what, those 10 or 15 people I used to hang out with, well, now I have all these new sober friends that I've met through all of my 12-step meetings and my aftercare and all of that, I'm gonna go and hang out with them. The deaf community, once they've been discharged from care, have a very hard time finding sober friends. So it's very, it, it's, it's difficult, okay? Um, what we're trying to do is we are, um, we're, we're, we're working towards staffing 12-step meetings, but we're also working on educating our deaf individuals on working on online deaf-only 12-step meetings so that they can find a network of sober friends that are deaf and can share that commonality. Okay, next slide, please. So communication, um, hearing world versus non-hearing world. We as hearing individuals can multitask. When Harry is speaking to me, I can take notes for myself and listen to what he's saying and write down notes, call this person, do this, do that. But unfortunately for the deaf, that's not possible. Um, so they're very dependent upon others. And gleaned information that we all get from hearing you know, history about our families is not something that they're privy to. Um, also where to access services. Service providers don't know what to do when a deaf person comes or is referred to them. I call it the deaf person freak out. Um, we are trying very hard here at DMHAS to educate as many providers and individuals as possible that we have services here. We have interpreters, as Harry said, it's a struggle, but we will do our best to provide communication access for our clients. Um, we want them to trust us. They've had a lot of broken trust. They've had them say, oh, go here, someone will help you. And they're just placed in a program and left by themselves. And so they don't trust the system. And, they're, and the stigma, what Dr. Gannon talked about stigma, stigma that is within the hearing world of addiction and mental illness is even worse within the deaf community. They worry about people finding out. Everybody in the deaf community knows everybody else and knows everybody's business. So they tend not to reach out themselves. They tend to come into care because they've been to recovery court. It's a condition of their probation or they've been in a hospital and have had some access and decide that they want to try to get help. But individuals coming to the decision of themselves that they've hit rock bottom and need to get some help is very, very rare. Um, next slide, please. Okay, Harry. So part of our challenges are, as Tevis just spoke about, and I know I'm, I'm, we're close to time, Andrew, so I'm just being, uh, conscious of this, right? Individuals have um, that are deaf and hard of hearing have issues with communication barriers. They experience depression and anxiety at a higher rate than the general population. It's difficult to find resources, which we're going to talk about on our next slide. And they still face discrimination and stigma. The trust factor, as Tevis just talked about, being um, discredited because many agencies don't have the resources in order to address their concerns. But the division is working to address some of these pieces. Next slide. Okay, so just to kind of get us here with um, our resources, um, number one thing to keep in mind is that any state or federally funded non-private entity 
is required by the Americans with Disabilities Act to provide accommodations for the deaf and hard of hearing. There are only two exemptions to the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that is religious organizations and private clubs. Everybody else that is open to the general public must provide communication access for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. So any provider has to accept a deaf person if they are referred to them for care. That's the number one thing you have to remember, okay? Um, where you can, where and how to get interpreter services, you can call me, okay? My numbers are listed on this slide. They'll be in the chat. We can email them to you. Um, I'm here to answer your questions, to help you with possible accommodations. Anything that you need, that you need help to assist a deaf consumer, you are more than welcome to contact me at any time. Um, my office number is 609-438-4346. My state cell phone number is 609-376-6340. There's my email. And you can also contact the Division of Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Um, so they are also available to help you. Um, so we really want to make sure that if a deaf or hard of hearing person is looking for services, that they get the services that they need and that they have communication access. It is, that is the number one barrier is the communication access. And we're working very hard to, to overcome that. Um, the division working closely with the Division of Deaf and Hard of Hearing have been very gracious and very open to having interpreters at public events. If you're having a public event, have an interpreter there. It goes a long way. Maybe there's not a deaf person in the audience, but maybe there's someone who knows a deaf person in the audience and says, hey, they're accessible. We can find you some help. So, Thanks. Um, so let me, Thomas, let me just, I'm sorry, if I can just, well, go ahead, I'm sorry. If I can just go back to the first bullet, right? So just so that you're aware, the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services, we have um, contracted mental health services, substance abuse service, opioid use disorder services, and alcohol use disorder. So in any residential ambulatory outpatient setting where an individual is trying to receive treatment, that contact to Tevis's office will assist them in trying to arrange an interpreter. So just so from an informational perspective, so that you, the audience are aware that although the division, the division has many, many services that are contracted, inclusive of prevention, early intervention services, the lack of an interpreter should not stop the referral. You contact Tevis as she noted in the below bullet, and we will work very diligently to provide you that service. I'm sorry, Tevis, I just want no, to- No, that's okay. I just wanted like to, if we can go to the next slide and then, um, cause I know I'm going a little over, but I wanna get this out there. Um, treatment solutions, making sure as providers that you're sensitive to the communication and cultural needs of this population. It's not a one size fits all. It's very individualized and we'll be happy to help you figure out what exactly this person needs and always asking the consumer. And that's part of anyone with a disability. Talking directly to them about what their needs and preferences are is very important. Contact me for ASL interpreter services or other accommodations that you may need. Please, if there's any way in heaven, you can strengthen your Wi-Fi signals because we do use remote interpreters very frequently because we are so shorthanded. And when we use them, we use them through Zoom. So just simple Wi-Fi boosters you get from Amazon to plug into the room that they're in will make a world of difference in the communication access. Um, also teaching when you're doing teaching for aftercare about accessing online recovery services for the deaf and hard of hearing. That's also very important. A lot of our deaf and hard of hearing individuals are very tech savvy, but a lot of them are not. So we wanna make sure that they feel comfortable and know where and how to access services. Begin the aftercare planning for treatment quickly, early, so that we have time to set up services and that we can make sure everything is accessible and ready for them to go. Um, and also training staff how to be aware that phone calls, that the deaf do have video relay phones and they can make calls directly to your services um, and know that the first words will be, this is interpreter number one, two, three, four, and that that is someone who is deaf calling you. It is not a telemarketer, so please don't hang up. <laughs> That's been the number one complaint with our, with our population trying to access care or information is that people are not aware of these incoming phone calls or 
that you can make an outbound phone call without having a video phone. If you need to reach out or return a call from someone who is deaf or hard of hearing, just dial the number they left for you and either an interpreter will come on and interpret the phone call for you, or you may have a captioner doing uh, CapTel, um, but uh, I can't talk today, sorry. Technology is getting better. So we are doing, we are seeing more with the hard of hearing community voice to text um, phones that are working really, really well, but just be, train your staff, let them know how these phone calls work and that will go a very long way to providing service. So thank you. I can do a whole day on deaf and hard of hearing access, but I will leave it at that. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks so much, um, Harry and Tevis for uh, talking about this really uh, population I think doesn't get a lot of um, attention when we talk about this issue, right? So appreciate uh, you being on and uh, particularly Tevis that information about um, when you get a phone call because I know we have a lot of um, providers on um, doctors and, um, you know, maybe getting that those calls in their offices and being able to train their office staff. So uh, thanks so much for that. Um, we have some time for a few questions. I know there have been some questions in the chat, but um, Dr. Gannon, I'm going to go um, to you and, and then I'm going to go to the rest of the panel. But, you know, we talked a lot today about um, barriers to treatment and barriers to recovery. Um, and just looking, um, what are some of the recommendations just from your work that we can also do to address some of the barriers in getting prevention or education out as well? So Dr. Gannon, I'll start with you. Well, the, uh, thank you, Angela. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the the last slide or two that I had in my presentation um, were to address some of those issues. Um, you know, I think that that harm reduction, uh, which is is sort of my my overarching philosophy, um, begins in the community and it begins at the street level. Um, I was privileged to work in, in a great program with lots of recovery coaches, a um, lot of, of ORP uh, coaches uh, and resources, and uh, a great recovery center uh, in the community. And those, that's where the education, to my mind, begins. It begins at the street level. Um, and, and I know that there are more and more uh, street-based resources becoming available in the street in the, in the uh, state rather. Um, and, and I think we, again, we need to, to bring the medicine to the people. Um, and the only way that, that folks are aware of what is available to them in terms of education toward treatment or toward harm reduction happens more at the street level than it happens in my office. All right. Thanks for that. And uh, Matthew, I'll go to you next. When we talk about, you know, prevention and education you know, before um, someone has uh, perhaps become addicted or, um, you know, begins to to misuse um, anything that that you guys are doing. I know we talk a lot about um, alternatives to opioids and, and you and I just recently worked on something with that. And, and so many times we hear, oh, we can't access physical therapy or we can't access chiropractic care because we can't get to those appointments. So is that something that you have any experience with, anything on your radar in your office? Absolutely. And I, I would uh, even add to what Dr. Gannon was saying is um, looking at the problems holistically. That's you know one of the messages I'm saying is you've got this group of, of people and you've got many groups of vulnerable populations. So each one has your, their unique context. But then what are the contributing factors? So when we talk about prevention, our office as the prosecutor's office has been uh, you know, moving more and more into how do we develop uh, ways of addressing traumatic experiences for youth? How do, we, how do we teach them resiliency? How do we partner to address you know, keeping um, our kids from getting hooked into the drug culture by, by bolstering their, their resiliency and, their, and, and reducing their risk factors. And so that becomes one of those dynamics. Then if you pair that with other efforts, like you just spoke about the medical prescriber education, where we're, we're trying to keep uh, people as opioid naive as possible, then you're not giving them 
uh, you're not putting them at risk for maladaptive coping, but instead those resiliency um, boosting factors have, have been very useful because it helps us culturally address how do we how do we think about the difficulty of just growing up, right? And then you add in all these exacerbating factors around poverty and access to care and um, even just the empowerment to dream, right, is one of the things that we've been focused on for economic opportunity or, um, you know, likewise, we're also trying to keep our kids here, right? So the someone in the chat mentioned licensure. And, and so for us, that means developing culturally competent clinicians, people that can see uh, kids now that can see themselves serving the same community and staying here has been another way that we're trying to say Prevention is going to have people that look like you telling you this is how you can get through these difficulties. Thanks so much. And um, Harry and Tevis, um, I know at the Partnership for a Drug for New Jersey, we do a number of, of um, messages in the media, you know, educating general awareness about, for example, the risks of, of prescribed opioids or how to safely dispose. How can um, we work better with you and those of us who are on um, the webinar today? you know, to be able to get some of that education, some of those messages out to uh, to people in, in the, the deaf and hard of hearing communities. So, Angela, let me just <clears throat> let me just say, so I do want to um, also highlight the division has numerous. Um, right. So our prevention unit and our research office tracks opioid use, opioid services. So you can always reach out to the division in terms of looking for data, looking for um, some of the other opioid projects that we have um, ongoing. So we have um, specific what, what's called SRO, which is State Opioid Response Initiatives. And these are numerous uh, initiatives that are, are addressing issues of pharmaceutical prescriptions, right? Working with um, private physician offices on opioid um, OBATs, right? Doing some um, working with, um, I'm sorry, private physicians out of their office, how to manage um, issuance of um, fentanyls and other opioid type um, of um, uh, medication. So the division has numerous um, offices that are covering all the topics that we're talking about here. And so, and it'd be great that you reach out if that's what you or Matt need, Matt Rudd um, from the, right? Because we also have many um, prosecutor diversion programs. We have we work with the administrative office of the courts, with the AG's office. So whatever resources are um, affecting the state, there's a good guarantee that somewhere in this division, there is someone working on that same topic and it's a good partnership. I just want to put the plug in for the division. And how can we get those messages, you know, uh, or how can we work uh, better to get those uh, messages out to to the deaf and hard of hearing community. Any so, uh, recommendations? I do, I do. And so uh, outside of looking at Tevis, but there is a division of metal, of deaf and hard of hearing, right? And so they're much more um, aware of how to address that population, how best to market to that population. So it would be reaching out to Elizabeth Hill at the Division of Mental Health, uh, I'm sorry, at the Division of Human, Department of Human Services, but her division, because they do work with entities, how to address, how, where to go, how to make that marketing a little bit more successful. So it's actually going to the right population. All right, thanks. I know we're we're um, we're out of time. Tevis, if you have just uh, 20 seconds of any other tips you might want to add. Um, I know we just um, keep calm. It's only hearing loss. Okay. Um, the goal, it, it's always okay to say, I don't know, but I know someone who can help. I will get back to you. Here's my number. Um, that's okay. Um, it really, it, that, that would be my number one thing to say is just keep calm, say, I don't know, but I do know someone who can help and work from that. Okay. All right, thanks. And I know we put your contact information in um in the chat so um that everyone that everyone has that. Um thank you. It comes to the end of our time. And so I want to thank everyone um who was uh one of our panelists today. Your presentations were also unique and uh really gave us a perspective. You know, we often hear 
Uh, I think uh, Dr. Gannon mentioned, you know, this isn't something that impacts my community. Uh, we're somehow isolated from it. And so important to see, you know, as we define community, what that means and how everyone is impacted and how we all kind of have a role and what we can do to uh, to help prevent, but also to help people um, who are impacted to um, get um, the help that they need. So I thank all of you. I thank all of our attendees for being with us today. I know there was a uh, poll that popped up. So I hope that um, you're able to take a minute to give us some feedback on uh, today's workshop. Also on the screen, you'll see information on how to access credit. If you need credit for uh, attending today's presentation, you'll see that information on the screen right now highlighted in red. And also um, you see information on um, our upcoming webinar, which will be January 25th, 2024. So I hope that all of you can, can join us for that important conversation as we kind of look at where we are in the opioid crisis in New Jersey. We're going to have a medical perspective, a law enforcement perspective and say, hey, you know what, let's take, let's take stock of where we are and where we maybe need to look and to focus on in 2024 and what emerging trends are are out there that we also need to be aware of. So I hope you can join us. I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season, a great end of year. And again, thank you for joining us. Thank you again for our panelists and be well, everyone.